It happened in 1983, or maybe 1984. The factory was still new then, built only six or seven years previously. Occupied Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen Lee Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector, all that stuff. It's New Year's Day. It's early in the morning. I decided that it was time to go back to a punk aesthetic, the DIY thing, and just film a, the, the Q&A, which I promised a couple of weeks ago. I was hoping to get somebody to interview me, like I did with The Good Doctor last year. So if you've not seen the original Q&A, do, because um, that's probably the higher production value. So, so I've thrown this together. But it's not about the presentation. It's about the content. So quick channel update on that. The production values will go up, but I've just bought a new camera. I'm not using it today. I'm waiting for some other kit to come. And there's all sorts of things planned. And we'll address some of it during, during the questions. And I'm just going to read these off, not in the order they came in. Some people posted a couple of questions, which is absolutely fine. And we'll just go through them and have a look. So am I hungover? That's the question. Well, I had one drink. I went to bed at 10 o'clock. Uh, of course, I was awakened at midnight by fireworks and stuff and my cat playing up, smudged the literary cat and may even put a picture of her in here. We may not. We'll see. So if there's any background noise, it's just the washing being done. It's the regular stuff. I've been up since about um, 7.30. You know, I've sort of made the kitchen look reasonable, all that sort of thing. Try and be civilised because the spring clean urge is already upon me. Anyway, without further ado, some questions. Um, first of all, from Aniket Sanyal. Um, and he said, are two part questions all right? Well, of course they are. You can ask anything you like. Doesn't mean I'll answer, but they're OK. So. He asks, um, I'm assuming it's a he, I'm, I'm not certain, so I do apologise if I misgender you. Um, um, so anyway, Anna Katz says, um, were you a New Worlds and or Interzone magazine reader doing regular issues coming out or by finding back issues? Um, OK, well, that's that's part one. New Worlds, I was pretty much too young to read New Worlds. Um, by the time it sort of researched briefly in the 70s, I was still only discovering SF. And so I wasn't really, I read the David Garnet ones, um, which were sort of early 90s. And, you know, that's the point when I was kind of losing interest in SF a lot. And it didn't sort of work so much for me in that way. But there's some good stuff in there. I mean, there's a great Simon Ng story on one of them called Brew's Time, which is fantastic, which is a Jerry Cornelius story, which is just absolutely brilliant. Um, but into zone, yes, I was um, pretty much from the beginning. And I bought it monthly for years and years and years. And... The fact is, although I love the non-fiction content and I've got huge respect for David Pringle as an editor and we've been in touch through our sort of various dealings with, um, with Deep Ends, the Ballard Anthology, which I contribute to occasionally. Um, it was a strange one for me because it was the time when sort of space opera was resurging in Britain and so some of the new writers seemed quite keen at people like Stephen Baxter, Paul McCauley and that didn't always grab me you know there was a sort of feeling early on that it was like a sort of successor to New Worlds and a lot of those sort of writers were in it so I was probably keener on it then um, so so really New Worlds I discovered in retrospect through anthologies particularly let's see if I can find it um, this one here, which was around in the early 80s with a handsome Hoan Miro cover published by Flamingo. And this is one of my favourite anthologies. And um, I'll mention some more um, New Wave anthologies. I'll be filming my first proper New Wave video coming up soon, apart from the Christopher Priest interview, which I hope you will have watched. But if you haven't, please do. If you don't know who he is, still watch it because it's very important. And you'll discover some great anecdotes about other SF writers. Um, and Anakit goes on to ask, um, do I have a favourite writer from the New Wave era from between 64 and 75? Well, you know, it's a question of favourite and best. I mean, probably my favourite writer for that period is Christopher Priest. As I said, he's my favourite living writer. Probably the best in that period, without any shadow of doubt, would be J.G. Ballard. But as Chris says in the interview I did with him, Ballard was a published writer before that, you know, and he was the one who sort of helped raise the bar. So that's a tough one. So somebody emerging purely out of New Wave at that point. Really, you know, it's a period where most of the key people were writing short stories and they didn't reach their maturity as writers till the mid 70s, about 75. I mean, I love M. John Harrison, who Anakette mentions, um, but I don't think that Mike really hit his stride until, you know, he did some great stuff in the 70s, obviously wonderful stuff. 
but I don't think he really hit his stride until the 80s when I think he really becomes something special. And I'd say the same thing about Chris as well, really. So, you know, so there we go. That's that sort of um, the question answered, I guess, the best of my <laughs> limited abilities, said laughingly. Um, Django Smog, what a great name, asked a few questions. And um, he says, I know you have a passion for books and music. In your opinion, which musician has been the most successful at turning their hand to writing? Well... I would say most successful is probably Jim Morrison of The Doors. Now, I mean, obviously, he didn't live to see the success in writing, though, of course, he wrote, you know, all the songs, apart from the odd cover version, he wrote all the lyrics, um, not quite all of them. Robbie Krieger wrote quite a few of the lyrics. I mean, like My Fire was all Krieger, apart from about two lines by Morrison. But obviously, he left behind a huge legacy of, of writing. There's a massive hardcover volume. Um, I used to read Jim's poetry back in the in the 80s. And, you know, I think so. He's successful. Um not many musicians really make some make a commercial success and aesthetic success is another another thing i mean robert calvert of hawkwind a supremely literal and literate um songwriter great science fiction songs he wrote a, a novel called um hype which is it's okay you know it's all right but i would say probably it's the other way around the person who was most successful as a writer but also did some music is probably mick farron and mick farron was um, in the social deviants, aka the deviants, he wrote songs for Pink Fairies. Um, but he was fundamentally a journalist and SF writer. And his um, rock and roll novel, The Tale of Willie's Rats, so I'll try and flash it on the screen maybe, is just fantastic. But it's not it's not a science fiction novel, you know, it's a it's a mainstream novel about rock and roll. It's very authentic, so it's great. Um, transitioning from lyrics to literature, who do I rate? Um, by that, Django, do you mean whose lyrics are literature. Um, that's a tough one. I think if that's what you mean, I would say probably um, David Bowie, Robert Calvert, um, Jim Morrison, Lou Reed, um, Patti Smith, I guess, you know. So these are the sort of people, you know, they're also kind of obvious canonical answers. They probably are others, but uh, I, I am quite sort of keen on lyrics in rock music and I think they're very important. I mean, one of my passions, which people struggle to understand, are the early works of Judas Priest, their first four albums, they're the definitive heavy metal band. And I think their lyrics in the first sort of four records, I mean, are often astonishing. And they're usually written by Glenn Tipton or Rob Halford, the singer, and I think they're amazing. But, you know, I've got a heck of a lot of music. I want to do more st music stuff on the channel. I started doing quite a lot. Probably my most successful videos have been music ones in terms of views. So there will be more of that as we go on. So I want to start to diversify the channel again. Obviously, when you have a channel, you have to get the views, try and keep it going, put a lot into it. It's good to get a bit of money coming to help support it and sort of cover the time and what have you, which has been happening. And thank you to everybody again for contributing so but i do want to sort of diversify more and they say with youtube that you can only do one thing successfully should have other channels but i'm determined to kind of break that and my um old friend and colleague jules burt he does lots of different strands in his channel we were talking about this and we said we'd get bored if we just did one thing so that's why i do the out and abouts so there will be more about um, music and um, more collecting things and more about literature broadly and um, I do wish people who watch the SF stuff would watch the other stuff as well because SF not in a vacuum you can't look at it alone you have to sort of have a wider corpus of culture around it to sort of really see what's relevant and viable and good you know context is everything. Django again asks um, about Kindles he said he sort of gave in a bought, bought one during the lockdown which is understandable um, how do I feel about that bit of tech, the way it is impacted and how we consume the, print, the printed word? Um, the Kindle, or let's just say e-reader, because the Kindle isn't the only e-reader out there. Obviously, that's the Amazon platform. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago in work, we briefly embraced e-readers and we had different ones. And I did some training. I had some training on that. I learned all about e-readers um, so I could sort of sell them successfully with the public. And we were selling Kindles and the original Sony ones, which use e-ink technology. I would say if you buy an e-reader, don't buy a Kindle, buy a proper dedicated e-reader with e-ink technology because it doesn't shoot photons into your eyes constantly. It doesn't use energy when you're reading a page. It's only when it turns a page and it's actually ink underneath the screen. It's very, very clever and your eyes won't get so tired. What do I think of them? Well, there was a period from about 2009 to 2012 when in the book trade we were really worried about the impact on printed books. And before that, when I'd been running a university bookshop for about 
10 years or so, there was increasing thought that in academia, because journals had gone online, the textbooks would become sort of e-read things. And we were doing a lot with customised bundle books. And by that, what I mean is that a publisher would come to me and they'd say, well, we've talked to lecturers in a certain department at the university where your shop is, and they want to use three chapters from one book, four from another and two from another. And they would do a print on demand thing. This book would be exclusive. You could only be bought from my shop, which was great for my business that I was running. And that was sort of the start of it. So there was real sort of concern then that it was going to hit academic book selling and reading and publishing heavily. And that resulted sort of round and roundabout way with a lot of bookshops closing on campuses. But what really happened, what we saw is for a few years, you know, Kindles were and e-readers were all the rage. And what it did, a lot of people had them as presents, you know, they had them as gifts. And they were often people who didn't read very much, who couldn't really make time or find time for reading. So we saw that for a long time. And of course, e-books were cheaper and what have you, generally speaking. Some of the sort of more best-selling ones weren't. But what it meant was that a lot of people self-published. Self-publishing is much easier now and has been increasingly as time's gone on. But just because you can self-publish doesn't mean you should. I have very strong opinions on this. And, the, you know, the E.L. Jameses, the Andy Weirs, they are the exceptions to the rule. They're, they're, the, they're the, the tiny, tiny, minuscule tip of a massive, immense, you know, cosmic iceberg. Because most of it isn't is rubbish. It's not properly edited. It's often written by people who haven't researched the market. They don't really know what they're doing. Um, and it goes to free or very cheap. And if you look on Amazon, you'll see loads of SF things popping up by people you've never heard of. And they're mostly self-published. And they're either print on demand or ebooks or both. Now, really, what this did after a couple of years, a lot of traditional readers um, and people are still saying this to me now regularly in work every week. You know, I like a book. I like the physical product. I like the physicality of it. I like the feel of it. People like the sort of the feel of a beautiful thing. You know, they, they want sort of the solidity of a hardcover, the, the sort of iconic beauty of a paperback, what have you. They want that sort of thing. And really, it comes down to the fact that a book has a soul. That's what I always say. A book has a soul. And soul is not a term I like to use a lot because I think it's very vague and indefined. But, you know, a book is more than just the text. It's also the iconography of the artwork, the publisher, the presentation, all those things, which, you know, mean that it really finds a sort of place in your life because we are physical beings. We live in a material world. We're materialist beings, even about things which are spiritual or intellectual. And really, you know, I think people rediscovered the beauty of the book and we've seen a resurgence in reissues of hardcover classics and modern classics in beautiful formats, multiple editions, and, and that says it all really. So what the e-reader really did was reveal that there was a large sort of fairly non-literate reading market that wasn't being served. Now, if you go back a hundred years ago, the mass sort of pulpy sort of thing was, was sort of matched by pulp magazines, you know, the magazines that wrote for, that were published, sorry, for the sort of, for the masses who are gradually becoming literate and more educated and what have you. And there's a wonderful book um, by John Kerry called The Intellectuals and the Masses. And it's about how, you know, a lot of the sort of figures in literary modernism, you know, said that reading wouldn't be a good thing for the lumpen because they just read rubbish. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Even though it came, you know, they all come across as terribly snobbish and Kerry really attacks them. Um, there was a kind of point, and I think what e readers have done, an awful lot of people who only had a Kindle and don't buy books and what have you, a lot of them are reading fairly low grade stuff because it's free or it's very, very cheap. So it's shown that there's a market for cheap popular fiction probably of not essentially great quality and that that market was being met because the magazine had collapsed a long time because so I think that's quite interesting so that's how I think it's affected it um I'm not really keen on reading things on websites I don't do any of that sort of reading myself I spend enough time on screens I like a book um, I really think a book is the thing but you know I think if you want to do it it's fine I mean for traveling an e-reader is absolutely fantastic and for mass storage of text it's fantastic but it's not the same as having a book in my opinion so it is one of those things really um so yeah it has impacted on how we consume the print word and you know if you use an e-reader you know I hope you're not insulted by any of this I don't think it's a bad thing you can obviously read all sorts of professionally published books and it's good 
Um, okay, moving on. Uh, Owen M. Owen, that's a good Welsh name. Um, <laughs> asks, um, what are my expert techniques for keeping my books in near new condition, especially if you were regularly reading them? Well, put it this way. I've had a lot of practice. I handle books every day at work. I have done for nearly 40 years. Um, I've always been somebody who values condition. I mean, when I was a teenager and I started buying vinyl records, I looked after them. They went in the PVC sleeves, what have you, that sort of thing. So it's just me, really. It's just, just the way I sort of do things. And um, because as when I started book selling and I was really in a phase where I was absolutely loved the written world and it was and it was sort of very sort of sacred to me. You know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. So all the jackets come off when I'm reading them, um, you know, that sort of thing. And it's just about taking care because I handle so many books. I find holding a book without breaking a spine quite easy, that sort of thing. So it's, it's purely sort of practice makes perfect, really. So there we go. Barry, hey, Barry. Barry's been with us um, some time. It's great to have a question from Barry. And he asks, do things like Folio Society versions of books appeal to you? What ones, if any, did, did I get? Well, um, I've only got one or two, really. I bought that Ballard one of the Drowned World a while ago, which was still sealed, which was nice. The only time I get tempted by Folio is when they do books in hardcover, which of course is what they do, um, which I don't have. Like at the moment, they're doing an edition of Jaws, and I do love Jaws, actually. I read it a lot when I was a kid. It was one of those things you passed on the playground. And of course, it's a lot bleaker and darker and harsher and a lot viler basically than than the sort of rather sanitized film uh, but i reread it a few years ago and it's just a cracking book it really is you know like, there's lots of things in it you could critique but it is really really powerful and it paints such a bleak view of human beings you know <laughs> it's very grim so i am thinking of that because i would like a really nice original paperback of yours but you can't find them and then my watch goes off in the background. Right, pesky Casio switched off. We can move forward. What else is there? Um, Lisa Garrity, um, who I haven't seen much activity from, but um, thanks, Lisa, for, for watching. I hope, um, hope you're still enjoying the channel. Um, she asks me, what has changed most for you starting your channel? Um, the fact that I've got, I, in a way, I'm wasting less time. You know, you sort of like, you sit around, you sort of fiddle around on the internet, you know, you goof off watching stuff on TV, streaming stuff. So I guess I put my free time to sort of more use. Um, it has been tiring at times, especially with the schedule I have, where because I'm not always hitting the algorithm, because I'm not young and beautiful and, you know, and doing all the sort of obvious clickbait things, I'm not getting masses of views and mass subscribers. We're growing steadily, but it's about quality of content, as I say, not presentation. So, um, yeah, it's been good to have a project because I'm notorious at sort of not... And I'm sort of, like I say, I'm a writer and I am, but I'm really lazy. I hardly ever write anything. But um, um, and because I've always been a professionally published writer, a nonfiction writer, you get the money or the promise of that front. And then when I've got a deadline, I do. When it comes to writing fiction and other stuff, terribly lazy because you, know, you can't sell it up front unless you're Stephen King, you know. So it's one of those things. Um, what surprised me most about being on YouTube? I don't know, really. Um, I, I can't think of an answer to that. I don't think... Uh, I, th I think how difficult it was in terms of the technical side of interpreting how YouTube worked was one of the most difficult things because there's all this terminology on there, but there's no gloss here explains what the terminology is, you know, and I do like a glossary. So there we are. Um, do I have a five year plan? Um, I do in that I hope to be still doing this in five years, not as frequently and hopefully to a lot more subscribers and more views as everybody who does YouTube wants to do. Um, but it really, it's just to sort of follow my sort of journey, really, my hegira across the world of books and how it's evolving at this stage of my life, really. Do I wing it from day to day? Um, yeah, you know, I've got a lot of things which I want to do and there's a lot of strands on the channel and themes and what have you and there's things that people ask for which i say i'll do and i'll get to um so i do wing it to a degree i do try and move through thematic things and occasionally sort of grand plans will come up but you know a lot of it is improvised and it is about how i feel in the moment as much as anything else so there is a bit of planning like for example i'm doing sort of author interviews now and hoping to do more of those because it's fun and taking advantage of the connections i have to certain writers which is which is great but um, yeah, a lot of it is improvised. So 
we will we'll just see and it'll continue to be that way so it'll be it's half planned you know it's a bit like jazz music you know there's a sort of sort of a chord sheet and you improvise over that or it's modal where I follow a melody and the melody gradually changes into something else you know we'll see so thanks for that Lisa grass daggers another great name I love these names they're brilliant and the grass dagger says that his question is in rather the same lines as Lisa's do I feel I'm into my groove now yes and no because it's quite hard to keep up at times you know you have to keep the enthusiasm up you know you've got lots of other things going on you have your own domestic responsibilities you want some downtime for yourself to get out and do things and and what have you you have your work there's all that stuff so so yes and no he also asks is it um, I'm assuming it's a he again sorry if I'm misgendering everybody but you know I'm an old guy you know I'm from I'm from the pre politically correct period is it frustrating maybe not to be able to cover more um, out and about guess that depends on the whims of the weather films music um, yeah I want to cover more and obviously if I if I was already retired which I'm not for some years yet I'd probably be doing four of these a week you know and covering more stuff and I will cover more but I will say there's lots of stuff on the back list which people haven't watched some of it is low quality in terms of presentation but the content is there so do look back at it. I know I'm always saying this and it's boring but there is some good stuff there um, out and about weather is a lot there will be more of that this year because I'm hoping to do some shooting overseas that's one reason for getting a new camera and I've been overseas for a while because of the, of the pandemic and work and stuff I think that's you know upset a lot of travel plans for all sorts of people so yeah so there will be more of that and there will be more films and music films is tough because there's copyright things to deal with same in music and it's more about the enthusiasm I have to feel the enthusiasm since doing more SF content on the channel I've regained my enthusiasm for written science fiction so it is that kind of thing where you kind of really and I'm, I'm always using kind of and sort of as terrible as dreadfully illiterate it's very much that you have to have the enthusiasm and you can't fake it really and I don't want to anyway I'm not an actor I want it to be real so it is about what I want to do so you know that's that's the thing has the channel met my expectations of course not <laughs> I want more viewers um <laughs> I want more subscribers yeah you know, it's been okay yeah it's he also says keep up the good work which is really great thanks a lot for that grass that really makes a big difference so I think Chris T we ought to Chris T then hey Chris um he'd like to know what my opinion of Neil Stevenson is well, Neil Stevenson, I've read some of Neil's work. I probably should read more. Neil's very much an ideas man, a big ideas man. And as I said on the channel, I, I hosted him once at a bookshop event. I went to the pub with him afterwards. He's a lovely guy, uh, full of ideas and really easy to chat to and really, really great guy. Um, I don't read a lot of his stuff. I find many of his books too large. I think they have a lot of ideas, sometimes too many. And even though... I appreciate him he's never really hit me where I live um, he's never really grabbed me enormously in the way that say William Gibson has so you know I think Neil is good but he's not one of my front rap writers personally but that's not due to any 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 reason why I think he's not any good I think he is good it's just he doesn't always move me in the way I like to be moved um, Chris also says he's seen me and Jules use the toothbrush method of cleaning to get rid of dust and he suggests the fine sandpaper and magic sponge yeah you know I, I think you know that's absolutely fine um I think Jules and I just do it as a quick thing really and I I don't spend as much time cleaning my books as Jules do, uh, does you know I, I just sort of find it because you do get a lot of dust on this it's just to get the dust off really I think when books get to a certain stage it's very hard to remove things like Foxy and what have you you basically can't do it so so it's just a sort of casual thing so moving on um Leo Pacara um asks was cyberpunk as a genre invented by William Gibson in the same sense the high fantasy genre was invented by Tolkien or does it have another origin? To go deeper into that question, first of all, I don't think the high fantasy genre was invented by Tolkien. I think it was invented by people telling stories in the oral tradition a very, very long time ago, you know, the sort of things which influenced Tolkien. And high fantasy, you know, it's only been really applied um to the sort of Tolkien-esque end of of um sort of traditional fantasy I think it's all sword and sorcery in myself I can see why people make a distinction it's a very fine distinction and if you look in the Encyclopedia of Fantasy edited by Cluedon Grant which is the authority as far as I'm concerned they kind of say that really the distinctions are so small between the two it's just the world changing thing you know and, and the quest thing is less of a picaresque narrative 
So I don't think Tolkien did invent it. I think critics invented it and applied it retrospectively, really. That's, you know, as happens with all these things. So anyway, onto the cyberpunk and Gibson thing. Well, of course, the word cyberpunk was coined by Bruce Bethke. It was the title of a story. And I think if I got, if I got Bruce's, I've got it at the damn there somewhere. It's inaccessible. I can't, it's near me, but it's right at the back. And, you know, you'd get all sorts of terrible shots of my backside or what have you, which you don't really want to see. And... Um, so you know that was that was the thing and that got applied i can't think actually who applied it to the genre there was one point they were being called the mirror shades group and what have you and i think cyberpunk for a start isn't a genre it's a subgenre of science fiction i also don't think it's much of a subgenre i think there's only the only real cyberpunk to me is gibson sterling and one or two of the other guys who are in mirror shades really and um, i've got a copy of mirror shades here somewhere again i probably can't find it but I would say if any one person invented cyberpunk, it was it was probably um, Bruce Sterling. I mean, Involution Ocean, his first novel, I always describe as the punk dune. It's also the kind of SF punk Moby Dick. And it's the attitude, the countercultural attitude in there, where um, the central character, John Newhouse, He's basically a drug addict. He's a street figure. You know, he's only on this alien planet. You know, it's not like in, in Dune where there's this highfalutin thing about the spice and it can do all this, that and the other. It's just a guy who wants to get um, get wrecked, you know. And it's it's sort of, it, that's a sort of more punk attitude to me. In terms of the cyber part of it, then, you know, I guess it has to be Gibson, you know. But it's, as I say, to me, it's not much of a genre. It's a handful of writers in a particular time. I think once it became labelled. You had an awful lot of bandwagon jumping, a lot of things which appeared to be cyberpunk, and they're completely inauthentic, you know. So I would say sort of the precursors, I mean, the people who regard as precursors of cyberpunk, people talk about Alfred Bester, people talk about um, Moorcock's final programme, they talk about Delaney, um, because of course people are jacking into the starships in Nova, which is a fantastic book. Um, but I think really the important thing is, is the punk thing, and Gibson kind of said, in his introduction to the 10th anniversary edition of Neuromancer. He says that, you know, the three main influences were a anthology of beat writing that he got off a rack spinner outside a drugstore when he was a kid, um, the first Velvet Underground album, the banana one, um, and Bester as well, the, the three things really. So um, it's, it's a combination. It's, it's just generally a counterculture thing. And you have to remember with SF that in the 1960s, particularly in Britain, less so in America, um, that the new wave, new world school was associated with the counterculture. It was the mid to late 60s. There were lots of drugs around. So it really was part of the counterculture, you know, in a way that it wasn't much in the States. You know, New Worlds was kind of like one of those underground magazines like Oz, International Times, Friends, those sort of things. And you've got to remember that Moorcock was sort of living in Labrook Grove, Notting Hill Gate. There were lots of rock and roll bands there, Hawk, Skin Alley, all those sort of people quintessence so it was part of the counterculture really which it sort of wasn't so much elsewhere so it's, it's had that sort of outsider thing so i do think that those things feed into cyberpunk and i think they've been sort of distressingly absent ever since you know so sf was more part of the sort of counterculture around rock and roll and radical politics and what have you but it's the post-war period a lot of things were changing you know so it is it is a different sort of thing those are different times as the song says then a question from Sylvan Young, who often posts, thanks Sylvan, you've been a real standfast on the channel, good stuff. And he says he's updated his list of authors and reading list a lot. And he asks who are, um, you know, the underappreciated authors, dead or alive, in SF and in their importance to SF. And he says that seems like a whole video. And let's not even look at movies. Well, you know, it is a whole video. I think really we'll be covering that. We've done a bit of that. There's been some things where I've looked at some popular figures or figures who should be more widely read, who already have cult sort of followings, which are quite large, like Silverberg, say. So really, I think that's something that will unfold gradually. But, you know, I mean, if you look at the people I'm, I'm interviewing, I am naturally sort of gravitating towards people I know or I've met or who I like. And they tend to be British literary SF writers. And a lot of them are underappreciated. You know, I, I'm not really some, somebody who's interested in people like Alistair Reynolds, Peter F. Hamilton. You know, I've met these people and they're very nice and their work obviously appeals to some people. It's just not my thing. So I think, 
you know, it is that thing. There's lots of underappreciated writers, but we'll come on to them as, as time goes on. So I'm sorry to fudge it a bit, Sylvan, but I do appreciate everything you've brought to the channel. Thanks a lot. Django Smog is with us again. And I'm reading these off the screen in front of me and see what he says. He says, who is my favourite Richard Burton? Is it the Welsh actor, the Victorian explorer? Only joking. Well, it's a tough one because, you know, Richard Burton, um, Sir, Sir Richard Francis Burton, the Victorian explorer, was the first man into Mecca. He was quite a character. Um, he's a character in Philip Jose Farmer's River Road books. There's a great biography of him called The Devil Drives by Fawn Brodie, which I have read, funnily enough. He was quite an out there guy. He was a bit of a sensual experimenter. So you can see why Farmer liked him. But yeah, I do like Richard Burton, I have to say. You know, I love his voice. And obviously he grew up not too far from where I did. So, you know, it's quite natural. And I love his work in films like Equus. And, you know, he was quite a character. If you've not read it, there's a wonderful book by a journalist called Robert Sellers called, um, what's it called? Hellraisers. And it's all about um, Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Oliver Reed and Peter O'Toole and their adventures, their bad behaviour. And it's a really fantastic piece of journalism. It's not just a piece of exploitative, you know, hack work. It's written really beautifully and very sympathetically. And he puts forward the sort of proposition that these guys, for all the sort of fun they had with their sort of drinking and carousing and womanising, actually could have achieved a lot more as actors you know that they underachieved and i think that's an interesting idea because they're icons but he sees them as underachievers and it's a really good book so hellraisers if you if you get out there and buy it it's really really good there's a quasi sequel called hollywood hellraisers which isn't as good and there's an a to z of hellraisers which i haven't looked at but there's some great great people covered in it. i must read that sometime so yeah so it's <laughs> it's uh, it's richard burton um the welsh richard burton i guess really so Django then goes to ask, have I been to City Lights in San Francisco? No, I've never had the pleasure of going to California. I hope to at some point. I will go there, of course, because it's important. Um, when I first joined, um, let's see, I think my third or fourth bookshop, we actually had Lawrence Ferlinghetti along to the shop um, and he was pretty old then. And, you know, but it was it was good to have a sort of a connection to the actual beat generation as such. Have I been to Shakespeare and Company in Paris? I've been to Paris, of course. Um, I've not been to Shakespeare and Company, though. And I don't know. It's, it's do I have a particular bookshops my holy grail to visit? I don't really, because I think the problem with really famous bookshops is that I suspect they come to rest on their laurels. And Shakespeare and Co, you know, this if you go there a certain time, you know, there's people queuing outside to go in. It's like all those people queuing to go to the Louvre to look at the at the Mona Lisa and take a picture of it. What's the point of that? You know, there's lots of other great outsider art and hidden things. And I mean the last time I was in Paris, I was there with some book selling friends. And I insisted we walk down um, Saint Germain, the Latin Quarter, and I was saying things like, Oh, you know, that's where Apollinaire lived and and I pointed out Dermago and I said, you know, Sartre and Camo de Beauvoir used to hang out there. And they were saying, how do you know all this stuff? I'm saying, well, I'm a bookseller. I, I, you know, you should know all this stuff. So, yeah, so, you know, I do, I, maybe I'll get to Paris this year. Um, maybe next year. I'm either going to go to, to France or Italy sometime this year. I, I don't know yet. I'm waiting for my holiday dates to be confirmed so I can firm things up. But I probably will go to Shakespeare and Company. But I don't really have a holy grail bookshop, really. Um, I think... It would be a second-hand bookshop because I'm never surprised in new bookshops as I know what's out there. So it's a tough one, really. But anybody has any suggestions of great second-hand bookshops in the UK or the States or Europe, which has a lot, European ones have lots of stock in English, um, you know, let me know. I'd love to know. So I don't really know. No, I'm enjoying myself at Zardoz a lot these days. So I am going to go and see a dealer I know um, in March, first ever time anybody's visited and filmed there. I'm looking forward to that. I'm slightly worried about my wallet there, but that's going to be great. So that's kind of, kind of a holy grail. There you go. So there we are. Miles. Miles asks, what's my opinion of the Gormenghast trilogy? Well, I think the Gormenghast trilogy is interesting. When I started book selling, it was very much one of the things people would read Tolkien and they wanted another fantasy trilogy. There was far less fantasy around them. We're talking 1984 and the fantasy boom in terms of sword and sorcery and high fantasy, whatever you want to call it, didn't really get going until um, the late 70s. And it was like one writer at a time. You had Terry Brooks broke through. Then you had Stephen Donaldson, then David Eddings. So it was literally a handful of guys. So it was all the original sword and sorcery guys, your Moorcocks, your Andersons, Vance, Lieber, what have you. 
And the books were short and episodic. There was Conan. And then you had Lord of the Rings, which was clearly a different sort of thing. So you had these then sort of few quasi copyists of Tolkien. And there wasn't a lot around. So people would go to Gormagas. Now, of course, Gormagas is a very, very different sort of fantasy to, you know, and like Lord of the Rings. Very, very different. So it was quite strange. <laughs> you did not often hear people come back and say, oh, yeah, I want more of that movie in Pete Guy. You know, he's great. So it was an odd one. But I do love the first book. I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's just brilliant. And just, people talk about the new weird, you know. There isn't a new weird, you know, it's always been weird and it comes from Peak and of course Peak had other influences. And I just think it's a fantastic book. It's really good. The second one I'm less keen on. Um, I do need to reread it because it's been a long time. And the third one, of course, is the one that's more like ASF. And the third one was sort of put together in a more more sort of readable form by Langdon Jones, a great Welsh, Welsh SF new wave writer. But yeah, I think it's really important. You know, I think you've got to read it. Even if you just read volume one, what's one of my rules with trilogies is, and fantasy is read the first one, then get out because that's enough. I don't usually want more, but at least the three books are different and they have different focuses and different approaches and, and the content's different, which is, which is good. So, so you can read them more like singletons, which I quite like really. Django Smog again, Django, you're really pouring it on, dear boy. Good stuff. And he asked what my favourite colour is. <laughs> Only joking. Well, it's blue. Um, and then he mentions Brandon Sanderson. And he says, Brandon Sanderson generated $41 million on Kickstarter this year. As a bookseller, how do I feel about that? Well, I don't know anything about this and I haven't researched it. But um, so if Brandon Sanderson started a, a Kickstarter for himself, $41 million, I mean, he sells enough books as it is. I really, I'm amazed about this. I know people have done me a little bit of super thanks, which is great. But when you're, when you're an established writer or, or a bookshop or something, you do a Kickstarter, I, I'm just, I'm just baffled by it. I'm sort of baffled by the cheek of it in some ways. I mean, in some ways, good for them. You know, it's, this is the thing, but I just find it utterly bizarre. That's the only thing I can say really. Um, Owen, um, that great Welsh name is back with another one. And he says, what the heck is going on with Harlan Ellison's estate? Um, my answer to that is, I don't know. I don't keep up. I've got, I've been a complete collection of Ellison. I've got more or less everything I want with the exception of Sex Gang by Paul Merchant, which I'm not going to pay 600 quid for. You know, it's one of those things. I don't really know what's happening. I know new editions are supposedly in preparation for Dangerous Visions and again, Dangerous Visions, but I, I don't keep up to be honest. So I'm sorry, sorry to have a look at the website and let's wait and see. We'll see what happens with Harlan. Just pick up his books where you can. And, you know, it would be nice to prop a mass market trade editions again so that Sue's and his wife could benefit because that would be a nice thing. And, you know, I just want to be able to sell them in proper editions rather than print on demand stuff. You know, come on. He's, you know, Harlan's dead, sadly. And, you know, he did really divide people. Um, I kind of wish I'd met him in some ways. I'm glad I didn't. Um, but, you know, it's just, just guess, let's get his name out there again and get people reading him because, you know, in his key period, he was fantastic. That's, that's all I can say. Barry. Hey, Barry, another stalwart for the channel. He asks, comics, graphic novels, hardback editions. Did you ever fall down that collector's rabbit hole? Yes. Um, comics less. So I was lucky. I was one of the kids who read the sort of first or second wave of Marvel reprints in the UK in comics like Mighty World of Marvel, um, Spider-Man Comics Weekly, that sort of thing. So that's how I really got into Silver Age stuff, big time. And graphic novels, the big boom was sort of mid to late 80s. That was an exciting time. So it was a great work being done for DC, mostly by British writers I had. Um, the likes of old Alan Moore and um, Grant Morrison, I, uh, my comic book idol, and um, Neil Gaiman, those sort of people, all good stuff. And yeah, I sort of fell down the hardcover bed when Marvel Masterworks started appearing. And in one of my videos, it's the shelf to a Demi shelf to a, is it the Demi one? I can't remember. It's one of them where I sh it's, it begins with lots of SF reference books. You can see some of my hardcover graphic novels. Um, yeah, I bought an awful lot of Marvel Masterworks. My basic plan was to buy everything I'd ever read in a hardcover limited edition format, um, which I did. And then I actually sold a lot of them on because some of them I went further along. I went into the Bronze Age. When you get the Bronze Age of Marvel particularly, so I'm more of a Marvel guy. Um, you get Jerry Conway, so first of all, Stanley, fantastic. Roy Thomas, like Stanley, but more literate and even better. Then you get Jerry Conway, he's like a third rate copyist to, to my way of thinking, and it didn't work as well, and it just got very, very tired. 
so uh, yeah to a point but I find now that I haven't read any comics for about five years. I picked up the odd old thing and reread it. I had a bit of a renaissance late eighties, early nineties when I got back into it. Because when I was in my teens, I decided about the age of fourteen that it, music was really exciting because it was punk rock and what have you, new wave, lots and lots of great stuff happening. Um, and I couldn't afford books, um, music, and comics, so someone had to go. So comics went, um, and then they came back in in reissues and what have you. So, but as I said, I can't really, I find that I've, I've lost interest. Contemporary comics have no appeal to me whatsoever. Even some of the underground ones do nothing for me, you know, and I used to like people like Dan Close and Seth and um, Chester Brown, particularly brilliant, really, really good, She's an amazing sort of writer and um, interesting artist. But yeah, so I'm out of it at the moment, but um, I can always get back in, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think comics for me now is going to be that period of nostalgia, really. but one day I'll show you my collection of Marvel Masterworks because they're gorgeous. Django again, audiobooks, yay or nay. Um, I've nothing against audiobooks. I've nothing against people listening to books. It can be very tiring sometimes to actually in your eyes to read. Um, you know, I can see why people stick their headphones on, listen to a download, what have you. I don't do it myself. I've got a few audiobooks. Um, so I guess it's more because I'm not that sort of technical. I don't use a smartphone, so um, I'm not at that stage where I'm using, you know, I can sort of download things with a smartphone, listen to them on headphones, what have you. I, when I'm out and about, I tend to want to be in the world and not, I don't want to be cut off. I don't want headphones on. I don't want to be so hardwired to the virtual, you know, I want to experience the, the real world. So, so not for me, but yeah, I'm nothing against them. And, and, you know, I think the fact you can get them on download now and the fact that most audiobooks and CD form around the bridge, I think is fantastic. It's much better than it used to be. Django again says, I've heard it said that being an avid reader is evidence of a damaged person. The idea being we should be out in the world doing stuff and talking to real people rather than retreating into pages of a book. Discussed. Well, I've just said about being in the real world. Um, I think everybody's a damaged person. I think part and parcel of going with humanity, the fact that we're animals who've achieved a certain level of self-consciousness, awareness of death and, you know, an objectivity about the world, something beyond instinct and what have you. You know, I think everybody's a damaged person. Are readers particularly damaged? I don't know. I, I mean, reading and books are so diverse, it's hard to say. Am I a damaged person? Probably. <laughs> um, I think we should be out in the real world doing stuff. But I think reading books is real stuff. And I think it's part of being in the world. It's a way of seeing reality, you know, through the glass darkly and what have you. And metaphorically so um when you talk to real people a lot of the time most of us would say we'd rather read a book than talk to real people it's all a question of choice isn't it being selective it's what you read and who you talk to and what you do and it's about what you want to do i think it's entirely up to you if you look at interesting thing recently several people um in britain who sort of played rugby professionally have started to sort of i think they started to sue some of the bodies that manage rugby for you know early onset of dementia because the injuries and things you know so you know that's that's the sort of thing that i think of you know it is about what you choose to do and it's a terrible thing but you know you do you do wonder you know if you make these sort of choices maybe if some of those guys who played lots of rugby had read more they'd be healthier maybe i'd be healthier if i played more rugby we'll see um and we're coming to the end now and i thought there were more questions but um it's um i'm just scanning through not as many as I thought, so it's not so bad. This won't be too long or too tedious a video for you. And um, Daniel Duval, um, Daniel, hey Daniel, a real a real chum of mine out there in social media land, um, post lots of great stuff. We support the channel. Thanks very much, Daniel. He says, is Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson a cyberpunk novel? What's your assessment of it? Um, it's a hard one because to me it's not. Not a cyberpunk novel. It's a postmodern slipstream novel, is what I would say it is. I think it has just as much in common with Gibson as it does with people like, say, Thomas Pynchon. It's very self aware. The fact that the character is called Hero Protagonist, you know, I mean, there was a time when that would have been um, radical. That probably was that time. It's early 90s. Um, I was never a massive fan of it. I mean, I remember reading the review in Locus of. Snow Crush. And I've never read such a glowing review of a book in my life. And even though I could have, I didn't buy the American hardcover edition, which I had because it's worth a bomb now. And, you know, I read it in paperback and, you know, the sort of whole skateboarding pizza delivery thing, all that, it never really did it for me. I probably should reread it. Um, so I see it more as part of the sort of thing that was going on then, there was a book um, by Larry, edited by Larry McCaffrey called Storm in the Reality Studio, which is about how 
cyberpunk was meshing with postmodern fiction and the slipstream, which was fiction that read like SF that wasn't SF. And the things, they, I mean, there's one point you've got for Bin Planet in the bigger shops and they'd have slipstream sections. There are things like Charles Bukowski in there, which, you know, are sort of like late beat generation or post beat literature. But it was that thing about being countercultural. So again, it was like a fallout from New Worlds and New Wave. There was that sort of ebb and flow. And I think that ended in the 90s. And that's where my interest in SF waned a lot. I think because um, SF stopped looking outwards so much at other media as it should have. Um, but I think Neil has always looked outward, you know, and there's that, the historical trilogy. So I think that's a good thing. So um, I probably really need to, to reread it, but it didn't grab me <clears throat> as much at the time as, say, Gibson's work was. But of course, he'd been going a bit longer. And I think really, if I wanted to talk about a more contemporary thing to point people to, where I feel that SF has intersected beautifully with the mainstream, where you have a true slipstream, where you have novels which are set at the moment that feel like they're SF. I would say the Blue Ant trilogy by William Gibson, which are just, you know, pattern recognition is fantastic. Um, really love that. That's the most sf -y one. But then the other two, which came quite some time afterwards, um, Spook Country and Zero History. Oh, man, they're the business. Well, I think that's it. I hope that hasn't been too tedious. We've got the questions out the way. I hope you um, Hope you sort of like the answers or find them stimulating. We'll do this again sometime. We'll probably get somebody to interview me. It'll be it'll be more more interesting to watch visually. So this is Outlook Booksala signing out for now. We're coming out of the hangover period of the new year. Give it a week or two. Things will get more exciting again for all of us. We've got to go through that pain barrier. And I'll be in touch. Bye for now. It happened in 1983. Or maybe 1984.